Hi, everyone. So glad to be here and so honored to be interviewing Dr. Mampela Rampele, who actually happens to be one of my personal heroines as someone who's cared about South African history a lot of her own life. Uh, Dr. Rampele uh, has an extraordinary resume of uh, courage and vision. She grew up in apartheid South Africa, became a doctor, was a co-founder with Steve Biko, her partner um, of the Black Consciousness Movement. She went on to become the first woman and the first black African to be vice chancellor of University of Cape Town. She was a managing director of the World Bank. Uh, she has worked throughout her life to merge her interest in public health with political consciousness, uh, working against racism, and as a proud feminist. So the purpose of these talks is really, as we've done all morning, to try to reflect on what women who have become leaders, what motivated them, what the turning points in their own lives were, what barriers they encountered, and what advice they'd give to have more women do what they have done. So I want to start out. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation to prepare for this, and I only wish you could listen to the whole 45 minutes that we spent. But uh, please tell me what motivated you to start in this path. First of all, let me say thank you to the women who led the way to get us here today. It's fantastic, and thank you. Susan, what I need to say to everyone is what was said by our keynote note speaker this morning. It's so important to know who you are. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? I grew up as a middle child in a family of seven. And one thing I knew very early in life was that my body was very small. I could never do anything really sensibly. But I knew I had a brain that worked. So I made a decision that I'm going to use my brain to the maximum that I could. And so the idea was made possible also by the fact that I was brought up by two teachers. So it was never a question of whether you went to school, but how well you do. And my dad was very tough with me because he didn't want me to just get an A. It had to be 100%. So I had the advantage of a father who believed in me, and that really raised my own self-confidence. And so be, having been brought up by teachers, I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> And, and so I wanted to do something more exciting. And so when I was in my final two years at school, I wanted to do, I fell in love with chemistry. I wanted to do, to be a, a, a chemist of note. And of course, my physical science teacher, who was a white man, member of the National Party, that is the one that was running a party, said to me, Mampela, I know this is what you want to do. Unfortunately, as a black woman, this is not a viable proposition for you. Your best bet is do the next best thing is to be a doctor. So I became a doctor by default. <laughs> That's great. And you told me a wonderful story that awakened you to the systemic nature of the racism you were facing, is that when this wonderful teacher encouraged you to look at medical school, you went to the pastor, the dominee, and he told you, why are you doing that? You should be looking after your father. And then when you got to medical school, you began to see the systemic nature of what you were up against. Well, I grew up in a mission station with the Dutch reform minister. So when I said I wanted to do medicine, I said, woman, black, my own daughter could never do medicine. She's just a nurse. And for uh, apologies to all the nurses. And so that made me even more determined. But what he said was also so crass. He said, you can't in any case be a doctor because your father is dying. I didn't know my father had cancer. And so that was the first time I knew this. And I'm all of 18 years, it was very traumatic. So I cried until I got close to home. I didn't want my mother to see that I was upset because I imagined what she was going through. So when I went to medical school, and my father, of course, died before I, I got to medical school. But when I got to medical school, for the first time, I was able to put together why this 
Pasta was so crass. Is this idea that because I'm black, I'm not a person. So the idea that you can't say that to a child about her father dying didn't occur to him. The fact that he's a priest didn't matter. And so my political consciousness was cut or was raised by us being put together at the University of Natal as non-whites. This is in Africa, just in case you've forgotten. <laughs> Somebody comes to tell you that you are non-whites, non-Europeans. We didn't ask to be Europeans, but no. So, but at first we were not really aware of the enormity of this negative designation. But the Black, uh, the black Power movement broke out here. The students. Um, uh, uprisings across the globe in the late 60s, we woke up and we said, but this doesn't make sense. So from that day onwards, we woke up, we went to the vice chancellor of the university to tell him to change the name, the designation, we are not none something. We are black, we are proud, and he's going to he even funded the conference that we had for that. And so I believe this idea of knowing yourself, naming yourself, and staying the distance in challenging those who other you is really important. But of course, as a woman in this black consciousness movement, when I woke up also to the idea that, hang on, these men think that I'm just an additional pair of hands without any, I said, but I'm also a woman. So I'm black, I'm proud, and woman. No, you are dividing the struggle. You oh. can't do that. I said, OK, divide me between the woman and the black person. It's not possible. So you're going to have me as both a woman and a black person. And this is how South Africa, in a way, was ahead of the curve in terms of not just fighting against apartheid in terms of racism, but also sexism. We brought that whole gender dimension into the struggle for freedom. And so I think that it's really important when something doesn't make sense, name it. That's right. Um, I think one of the other fascinating things that we spoke about is that uh, as you were going to, you were becoming black activists. You and Steve Biko were founding the movement together. Then Steve Biko was killed, uh, and you were banned. Uh, and eventually, uh, through the efforts of many people, you made your way to the United States and began looking at um, migrant workers. And one of the themes we discussed was the importance of understanding, having compassion for why men oppress women. What actually has happened to them psychologically, how their own humiliation and oppression has led them to oppress women, and how you enlist them. So I wonder if you could talk a little about that. Well, you talk about I've, I'm where I am because I was supported by many people. And there is a person here who supported me and brought me to the United States for the first time, Dana Shalela. But she's also guilty of another thing. You see, my nails are always painted this way. <laughs> She took me to her many and petty spa. <laughs> the first time I came here with my very rural hands and said, no, 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 we've got to put an end to this. <laughs> so you've got to blame her for that. <laughs> but the, the point is also that I, as of, I've already spoken to you about my science teacher. I had the good fortune, but also the sense to attach myself to men, white men, as mentors. And this made a huge difference because, first of all, I, didn't, I wasn't a threat to them. And second, they'd walked the distance of power, so I could learn how these things work. But in the South African context, we have, up to today, the impact of multi-generational humiliation that was visited upon indigenous people. And for men, that humiliation has left deep scars. And to, to not recognize that, 
I think is to, to undermine our own cause as women fighting for gender equality. That this is about fighting against sexism, but not against men. And this is very important because men are part of what we want to see operating and to see them at their fullest potential. Because without men and women together, we cannot have humanity. And I believe it's very important for us as women to bear that in mind. And I want to introduce the notion of, we're talking about global health, but we need to also think about the health of nations. I come from a multiple traumatized nation called South Africa. And this is the reason why the men post apartheid who are now running the country can run the country to nothing. They can steal money. Not like women, we, we are the keepers of the seed. They don't know how to keep the seed because what they are doing is to model themselves on the white men oppressors who humiliated them. And so our journey of transforming our societies has to include this element. And so I am now working as part of this whole process and having done my PhD on the politics of space. And again, another man, Dave Hamburg, uh, helped me to get to Harvard University at that time. The idea that men in South Africa, black men in South Africa, were humiliated, called boys, put in single sex hostels, and treated in the most degrading way. And so our challenges in South Africa is that we have this human rights constitution. We have all the rules and the laws that were referred to earlier on by my sister from Rwanda. But we can't, we don't have the capacity to implement because the leaders who are in charge of government are so deeply traumatized that all they want is to reward themselves. And so we as women must also understand that the responsibility we have is to heal our nations. And so right now I'm doing work as a 70 year old uh, to reimagine South Africa and focus on the healing of the bonds between us as South Africans so that we can develop citizens from primary, secondary university and professionals who are informed, confident, and able to live the human rights values of our constitution. And that's the only way South Africa can make the true transformation from apartheid to a human rights a social justice society. And so I believe that this initiative that we are launching here has to be sensitive to that. I mean, the Afghanistan story, the, everywhere you look, you are looking at multiple traumatized societies. And I think we need to bring the healing element into those national issues. Um. We also spoke, you know, drawing from these lessons that you absorbed and took action about, about some of the structural barriers to leadership now. We talked about old boy networks. We talked about failure to see, as many women do, a more a, a, a broader and more integrated approach. Can you talk a little bit about those structural barriers, and then we'll take one question from the audience. Yes. The structural barriers are largely traditional. But also, women themselves don't give themselves permission to be the innovators that they know they are because they are afraid of being unpopular. Now, one of the good things is that I've never been in the popularity game. And so you do what is right for the right reason. Of course, you don't alienate people in the process, but if it needs be, you need to actually make those unpopular decisions. Like at the University of Cape Town, when I was the vice chancellor, sexual vi I mean, uh, uh, harassment, racial harassment, and just general, that 
toxicity that comes with chauvinistic male culture. And when I said, but we can't have girls being harassed, they said, well, boys will always be boys. I said, no, boys become men. And this is our responsibility. And so it's very important that we develop the first policies against harassment, not just sexual, but general and so on. But also developed a student uh, program to help students to understand what it means. I mean, if you grow up in a society which is sexist and racist, how do you learn to become other than? And so civic education, values-based civic education, is absolutely fundamental. I mean, the likes of Stanford and Harvard and so on, they, great, they provide great education. But do they pay attention to the issue of civic duty, values-based civic duty, so that young people, when they leave our universities, they're not just great engineers, but they're great citizens. Because that's the way we're going to build a great global society. Thank you. Would you like me to take one question, or do you want to go to the next? We have time. Who would like to ask a question? Ma'am. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, you got it. Eight, nine, ten. Go right ahead. I'm going to put you a little bit. From the University of California Global Health Institute, and I just came from your incredible country. Very impressive. And I just wonder if you could take a few more minutes to say what you are doing on this. I love the idea of the healing, but if you could give us a little bit more of an example of your own efforts to, to help heal the country and, and how that might uh, make this shift um, in the current political situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. When we adopted our constitution that many of you helped us get there and celebrated with us in 1996, if you read the preamble of our constitution, it's on the web. It says, we the people adopt this constitution so as to. The, the drafters of the constitution were very wise. They knew we were like unlicensed drivers. You couldn't take an unlicensed driver and put them behind a wheel. But this is what it is. We did not do what they said we should do in that preamble. First, heal the divisions of the past. Because when you have black and white people growing up to say you are inferior, you are superior, you've got to have a way of talking around that so you can reconnect that human connectedness. Second, we said we will establish the foundations for those values, human rights, dignity, social justice, equality for all. Did we have any program for that? No. Third, we said given that we come from engineered poverty, we've got to have a re-engineering program to create a more social justice society. But did we do that? No. And as a result, the human potential we're supposed to have freed through this, those four elements is the healing, is the values-based civic education, is the equality in terms of socioeconomic opportunities, but it is also that we as a sovereign nation we're going to take our place. But do you see whose company we are keeping now? Yeah. So we failed four out of four with what we said in the preamble we're going to do. So many of you will know that in 2014, I got so desperate that I decided to form a political party. Bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad I did it. Because I had, my idealism told me that people were ready to do something to, no. They are, re, they are angry, they are complaining, not necessarily ready to do the next thing. So the, neck, the, what, the readiness program are those four elements. So we've launched a platform called Reimagine South Africa. No point in complaining about Zuma's corruption. Please, just focus on what we, the people, said we wanted to do. Once we've got that done, Zuma is history. So we are linking with schools, universities, 
the corporate sector, faith-based organizations to say to them, you will be so much better performing if you had civic education in your program. And also that the <coughs> values of our constitution are really the glue. You talked about trust this morning. You cannot have trust if you haven't reconnected people and if there isn't a shared sense of values. And so the work we are doing is non-party political, but is very political in the sense of it's about citizenship, the quality of citizenship, so that we as South Africans can be licensed drivers of our constitutional democracy. It's so exciting. Because when you start, people say, oh, heal, oh, you know, that's soft stuff. <laughs> but when you start talking about it, they realize that this is the missing link. You can't cajole people into loving one another, but you can show people how much better society would be if we did this reconnection. So I'm having fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.